we have is the MRI of placenta and this will be by Dr. Manjiri Dige. Dr. Dige is Professor of Radiology at Medical and also Medical Director of Ultrasound and Director of Ops Imaging for Radiology and Adjunct Professor of Ops and Gynecology in University of Washington. She is Fellow in Society of Abdominal Radiology and Society of Radiology in Ultrasound and she has received several awards and fellowship uh, including the Melvin Figley Fellowship in Radiology Journalism and awarded by that has been awarded by the American Ron Jin Ray Society. She was past section chief of body imaging in University of Washington. We are thankful to you ma'am for your contributions to this course and our learning and let's begin with this talk. Good morning. My name is Manchure Tegye. I'm a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, my topic, topic of presentation today is MRI of placenta invasion spectrum. The goals for today's presentation include brief review of the epidemiology, uh, discuss the common findings uh, on MRI, we'll look at some pitfalls and then also look at some management implications and some potential areas of improvement in clinical practice. We know the incidence of pa PASS has been increasing over time, which is mainly because of the increasing rate of cesarean sections. Ultrasound and MRI are performed for diagnosis and are considered important methods to reduce the risk of maternal morbidity and mortality. Now, in normal placentation, extravelar strophoblasts invade uh, the decidua and convert the spiral arterioles of the endometrium to utroplacental vessels which is basically desidualization. The trophoblastic proliferation leads to formation of the chorionic villi. If the underlying endometrium is deficient, desidualization fails and the trophoblast or chorionic villi invade and penetrate the myometrium. This abnormal vascularization can be due to scarring after surgery, which leads to hypoxia and this leads to the defective desidualization and excessive trophoblastic invasion. Nomenclature used for PASS includes uh, pathologic nomenclature, which is a creator seen in about 75% of cases, and then um, in creta seen in about 18%, where the villi actually invade into the myometrium. In a creta, they only adhere to the myometrium. Per creta seen in a smaller number, about 7% of cases, where the villi extend through the myometrium into or beyond the C rosa. So these are the different forms of uh, 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 pleasant. Um, placenta creta spectrum or morbidly adherent placenta. This is normal, this is in a creta, this is invaded into the myometrium and so in creta and then through and through and through the seros are super creta. The amount of placenta involved can also be variable. It can be total where all of the placenta in, is involved. It can be partial and also it can be focal. The incidence of placenta um, uh, creta has increased uh, about tenfold in the past 40 years. In 2016, a study was conducted using the national inpatient sample and they found that the overall rate of placenta creta in the United States was 1 in 272 women um, uh, 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 for who had birth-related hospital discharge diagnosis, which is higher than any other published study. The rising incidence of placenta creta spectrum correlates with the global increase in C-section rates. So, um, in 1965, the rate of C-sections was about 4.5%, but that has increased to 31% in 2017. So although PASS is considered a rare condition, its incidence has increased tenfold in the past 50 years. And the issue is this. This is uh, a surgery being done in a patient with uh, a creta spectrum. And you look at the amount of hemorrhage that this patient has. As you're trying to get in through the placenta, get to the baby, there's a, you know, this is getting through the uterus. Uh, they will be opening up the amniotic cavity soon. And so then be uh, delivering the baby. But it's just a bloody mess. Um, uh, there's, and this is the reason why there's maternal morbidity and mortality. Now they are try they're through the amniotic fluid and they're trying to get the baby out. And you can see the baby's hand over here. Uh, so the hand is out and then the baby's head is out. So looking at the amount of bleeding, this is just getting the baby out. Then the uterus needs to be resected if necessary, along with you know, obviously the placenta as well. So 
um, this is a bad disease uh, or a bad condition, not necessarily a disease, but a bad condition that needs high expertise and um, can, can actually pr uh, lead to uh, maternal death as well. So what are the risk factors for placenta creta spectrum? Um, so if a placenta previa along with C-section is considered as having the highest odds of placenta creta or placenta creta. So if you have a C-section along with a placenta previa, your risk of placenta creta spectrum increases to 67%. Um, uh, if you've had myomectomy or DNC, there's an increased risk as well, but smaller. Um, Advanced maternal age has been considered to have a higher risk, about 3%, but we don't know if it's age or if it's parity. Some of the clinical markers that can be used include um, uh, the placental biomarkers like high AFP, plasma protein A, human placental lactogen, um, and the total placental cell-free mRNA as well, which can be evaluated to assess for placenta creta spectrum. So why is prenatal diagnosis crucial? Because it allows uh, for us to plan for optimal management, um, to decide the timing and the site of surgery. It is important because you need um, blood products and a skilled anesthesia, surgical and interventional radiology team uh, to be ready. Um, uh, C-section is usually planned at 37, 36 weeks of gestation to minimize the risk of spontaneous labor and, and surgical planning has to be individualized according to the imaging findings and the patient risk factors. Um, the importance of antenatal detection of invasive placentation also relies on the fact that maternal morbidity has been shown to decrease when these disorders are diagnosed prenatally because it allows for all this um, uh, pre pre-planned treatment as well. Other thing to consider is that fertility counseling needs to be considered with the with the patient uh, because with this condition the uterus might not be saved and the patient might not have be able to have any more kids in the future so um the uh, out of the MRI indications, um, mostly, most commonly, uh, limited or inconclusive ultrasound uh, leads to, you know, an uh, uh, um, MRI being done. And mostly it's for patients who have high BMI, other causes. Sometimes the placenta is posterior and lateral, and it's difficult to see it on ultrasound. Um, and it, it is also helpful to increase the level of confidence, especially in high-risk patients, and then to assess the depth of invasion in these cases. Um, we don't know for sure if MRI does allow for better delineation, if it allows for a better you know, modification of depth of invasion or change in management. And these are questions that need to be answered in the future. We usually perform MRI at between 23 and 30 weeks of gestation. Um, patient is, is supine or in the left lateral decubitus if, they, if she's in third trimester because they may not tolerate the supine position. Uh, bladder is usually moderately full um, uh, and we use a multi-channel uh, phased array surface coil or a body coil. Um, we usually have a radiologist available at the scanner to look at the images and decide if any uh, modification or additional images are necessary. Uh, we use a 1.5 Tesla scanner, um, but three Tesla can be used. There can be technical challenges um, because of the dielectric effect. But it, if if someone uh, if you have good expertise, you can use a three Tesla magnet as well. Um, so, uh, as we mentioned, between 23 and 30 weeks of gestational age, um, uh, there's no incidence or, or no evidence for increased risk of MRI at any point in gestation. So that's important to remember. That's actually an ACR policy that has been that has been published. We don't use any contrast. Uh, uh, there, there's been no need for contrast shown in uh, the published studies. Um, we get an informed consent from the mother because uh, there's, you know, there's lack of evidence based on the delet deleterious effect of um, MRI, uh, if any, on the fetus. Um, it is just not enough. There's no evidence. Um, so we usually get an informed consent from the mother. So about 23, 24 weeks to 30 weeks. Our, our, our protocol includes a um, single shot. Uh, fast spin echo sequences in three planes. Um, we adjust the field of view according to what is necessary to cover the placenta. We sometimes, we, we do get a T2 weighted balanced FFE ex image as well and we might get two planes either coronal, uh, axial and either coronal or sagittal. We get a T1 weighted sequence. It can be either in an axial or sagittal plane. We get a, D1, um, a diffusion weighted image. Um, we usually get that in axial, sometimes in sagittal as well. And then, as I said, we don't give any IV contrast. 
So these are just two images showing the uh, utility of balanced FFE images. We think balanced FFE images help a lot because um, one, it gives you this India ink artifact between the bladder wall and the uh, placenta. And we find that to be really helpful when we're looking for invasion into the bladder wall. So in this particular case, these are similar images or at the same level. And you can see that there's some focal disruption seen over here, but I'm not really confident about the rest of the wall anteriorly. But on the balanced FFE image, I can see that the India ink artifact is preserved everywhere except for this focal area where I suspect there might be a small focal invasion or focal percreta. The other reason we do balanced FFE is because it helps in differentiating between vessels and um, our uterine wall because vessels are usually bright on balanced FFE images. What does a normal placenta look like? It is homogenous. This is a placenta at 22 weeks and you can see that um, it, it, it has uniform um, uh, appearance. These actually are dark areas along the periphery are small vessels. Um, they're not T2 dark bands. Um, and then at 33 weeks you can see that the, homo the homogeneity decreases and you get more of a heterogeneous appearance of the placenta. Um, but if you see a relatively homogeneous placenta, uh, that can exclude abnormal placentation with a high level of confidence as well. So we'll look at the features later, but this is what a normal placenta would look like. Normal uterine wall, um, so it can be uh, dark on T2 weighted images. So you can see the wall over here on both sides. Uh, if you have a lot of vessels in the uterine wall, it can appear a little bright as well. So it can be a mildly hyper intense on T2 weighted images. Um, so you need to know, uh, you know, look at multiple sequences, look at multiple, you know, and balanced FFE, of course, they look, the uterine wall looks dark except for the vessels which look bright. So, um, uh, you know, we the, in the literature there is uh, inconsistency and variability on the imaging no nomenclature that ha has been used for past interpretation. And clinically as well, my colleagues may use different terminology compared to me. This creates confusion among radiologists and clinicians and adds heterogeneity uh, in data collection, which makes, um, you know, it has an impact on the patient ca patient's care. So um, this particular group, it's the European uh, Working Group on Abnormally Invasive Placenta launched the proposal for ultrasound and MRI descriptors. The ultrasound descriptors were uh, published in 2016 and the MRI descriptors were uh, published in 2019. And they aim to reduce the ambiguous terms and define standardized terminology. So um, they believe that this will benefit future research, clinical care and teaching aspects. This can be found in this particular article by Morel in 2019 and this is the one that describes the MRI uh, features. So I'm going to use the standardized MRI descriptors uh, and, and, and we'll talk about the findings on PASS. So these are the descriptors that I used and we'll go through each and every one. So the first one is heterogeneous placenta. So normal placental signal appears as homogeneous T2 hyperintense and relatively T1 hypointense. Um, there is, of course, inter-observer, uh, uh, there's moderate inter-observer agreement because this is a subjective uh, uh, feature. Um, you can have heterogeneity from advanced gestational age, hemorrhage, and then T2 dark bands. And then, as I said, uh, absent heterogeneity implies either absence uh, of pass or a less severe form of pass. So just to show you the difference, this is a homogeneous placenta. Uh, this is a normal placenta with a homogeneous signal. Compare that to this particular placenta, which has a very heterogeneous signal within it. This was a case of placenta in Creta. So the key in this particular descriptor is looking at the signal of the placenta. Placental bulge. This is deviation Deviation of the seros are from the expected plane and it's caused by an abnormal bulge of the placental tissue into the neighboring organs. So the uterine seros appears intact but the shape is distorted. So when you look at the uterus it has a pear shaped appearance but in this lower uterine segment you can see that there's this abnormal bulge. Um, so this abnormal bulge suggests pass with a high sensitivity and specificity almost up to 89 to 90 percent or so. So this is what a placental bulge look like. looks like if you draw a line along the normal uterine wall, you can see that this part of the placenta is bulging outside. Um, placental in the in Chen in their um, um, published paper in 2018 described uh, this finding and had actually and classified them into different types, type 1 and type 2. 
in type 1 the uh, bulge is uh, it, it distorts it slightly outwards into the subjacent myometrium but the outline is intact so you can hear you can see here that the outline is intact but the placenta does bulge a little bit outside in uh, type 2 there is focal bulge which distorts the outline of the uterus uh, and there's the uh, there's a um, blur blurring of the subjacent outline so in type 2a you'll have these bridging vessels type 2b will not have bridging vessels we don't necessarily use these types but it's important to remember placental bulge, bulge as a feature in pass and the key here is to look at the uterine outline or uterine serosa and see if it's intact or not Dark intraplacental bands are one or more are one or more areas of hypointensity with a linear appearance in contact with the maternal surface of the placenta. They correspond to fibrin deposits, and it's considered as one of the best features to detect pass and has very good inter-observer agreement. So normally, um, you can see them in normal pregnancy after 30 weeks of gestation, especially in patients who have preeclampsia and IUGR. But they are probably related to uh, placental infarcts. Um, uh, uh, as such so this is what dark intraplacental bands look like so you can see these dark bands in the placenta they do extend to the placental the maternal surface of the placenta um, and the key here is to look for these dark areas within the uh, placenta now we said they are fibrin deposition um, and they may still be, they may still be a false positive and the false positive as I said is probably because of placental infarction they seen about in about 5% of normal mature placentas. Um, they have no significance um, uh, un unless of course the patient has IUGR or preeclampsia. Um, you can also see dark uh, intraplacental bands in patients who have intervillous thrombus or they have or patients who have uh, bleeding and intervillous hemorrhage when they have seen in the subchorionic region but there are ways to deal with that as well. So just an example um, this is a patient, uh, twin pregnancy, twin A had this dark appearing area within the placenta. Um, this was uh, diagnosed, you know, this was read by two attendings uh, at two different times um, and reported as, you know, placenta creta, but there was no placenta creta on pathology. Um, so these are just two images in this particular patient. Uh, patient did have severe intrapartum bleeding and lower uterine segment atony um, but when the pathology came back for the uh, uh, the placenta it said that there was extensive fibrin deposition because of chronic placental insufficiency so this was probably an area of infarction in this placenta and not necessarily a dark intraplacental band leading to placenta creta so this was a false positive case uh, Kudbert in their paper in 2016 had this example of um, uh, you know a pitfall so this patient had in dark areas seen on titrated sagittal image um, and you can see that you know the asterisk marks are these are images from their paper and and this was dark on um, multiple sequences this was sagittal this was coronal and you can see a dark band in that region and so um, you would think that this is probably a dark intraplacental band but if you look carefully at the balanced gradient echo image you can see that there's bright signal in this region and this was actually um, not a a placental, uh, uh, a dark intraplacental band, but it was a recent hemorrhage. So the T1 sequence actually helped in um, evaluating this area and avoiding uh, uh, a missed call of uh, placenta creta. This is an example from our institution. Uh, this patient had, so these are axial T2-weighted sequences, coronal T2-weighted sequences, and then balanced FFE. So this just illustrates why balanced FFE is helpful. There's an, a dark intraplacental band in this region and um, uh, on an axial image, coronal image, it corresponds to this particular area, but this area was bright on balanced FFE image. When you look at the uh, a different area in this patient of a dark intraplacental band, uh, axial, coronal, and then this is the balanced FFE image. You can see that on the balanced FFE images, these Ba dark intraplacental areas actually look different and that is the reason for this is because this was a dark intraplacental um, 
are banned but this particular thing here was in was a blood vessel so blood vessels are bright on balanced ffe image and they are, they 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 balanced ffe can help differentiate between these two things whether it's a dark intraplacental band which is a fibrin deposition versus an um blood vessel so we find balanced ffe images to be quite helpful for us in some of these problem solving areas um, placental ischemic infarction is another feature. You can see it on T2 weighted and T1 weighted sequences. They appear as increased signal intensity on T2 and decreased signal intensity on T1. They can result in placental heterogeneity and they can be seen in patients with preeclampsia or IUGR. So this is an example um, which shows an intraplacental infarct. Um, so the key is to look for intraplacental pathology and um, you know this is a uh, 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 T2 weighted sequence, this is a T1 weighted sequence, on T2 it's bright, T2, T1 it's low signal intensity and diffusion is helpful here because on diffusion you can see that there is um, a restriction but um, this was you know this was seen as um, a bright area on T1 weighted images and, and low signal intensity on T2 weighted images so that's how we could make the difference. Um, loss of retroplacental dark zone, which is this is a thin dark line. It is non-specific, can be seen, uh, can be absent in normal pregnancy as well. So this particular area, you can see this dark intraplacental band as an interface between the placenta and the myometrium. And in the lower uterine segment in the same patient in this particular area, you can see that there is, uh, we don't see this dark intraplacental band. Similarly, in the um, on an axial image, you can see that posteriorly this dark intraplacental band is lost in patches. Um, so this is considered as one another feature of uh, placenta accreta spectrum. Myometrial thinning is over thinning of the myometrium to less than one, one millimeter, so basically being invisible. It is seen on T2-weighted sequences. Um, normally, the myometrium does become thin as the pregnancy progresses, but especially at areas of prior cesarean section scars, it is known to it can thin out quite significantly. So, non-specific um, appearance, um, but this is another feature that we look for in placenta creta spectrum. So this is just to show you normal myometrium overlying the placenta. You can see very thin myometrium. Um, this is just a zoomed up image and you can see normal myometrium here and then does become quite thinned out overlying the placenta. So you would suspect placenta creta spectrum because as you see the placenta, normal myometrium is thinned out and there's probably invasion into the placenta. Bladder wall interruption, which is irregularity or disruption of the normal hypointense bladder wall. It has high specificity and positive predictive value, but low sensitivity for prenatal accreta de detection. Um, these are examples of bladder wall uh, 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 invasion. So T2-weighted sequence, and you can see focal area of disruption uh, of this hypointense line of the urine uh, bladder wall. And this is a zoomed up image showing the same thing. So the key here is to look for this hypointense line uh, along the bladder wall. Focal exophytic mass is a break or extension beyond the uh, uterine serosa. So you'll see placental tissue protruding through the uterine wall and extending beyond it. So uh, most often because the placenta previa is associated with, you'll see uh, it along the, um, you know, as a mass filling the bladder, uh, uh, it's filling the bladder. Um, it predicts placenta percreta, uh, but does have low sensitivity. And so this is an area of focal placental, uh, focal exophytic mass. As you can see, there's extension of this placenta beyond the uterine wall and beyond the serosa as well. Um, abnormal vascularization of the placental bed, which is where you see large vessels within the, within the placental bed with disruption of the utero-placental interface. This is seen on a T2-weighted sequence. So um, the, this is an example. So there's increased number of vessels seen over here on a sagittal and a axial image. This corresponds with the ultrasound finding of increased vascularity as well. Um, and and uh, so this is an area of subplacental hypervascularity. So these are the features that we see on MR. Um, these are the previously used terms and the recommended terms. Um, marked placental heterogeneity is called as heterogeneous placenta. Um, uterine bulging, we don't really have a definite word for it, but you now we use placental bulge as a, as a description. Um, these three words, these three descriptions are used, were used for loss of retroplacental dark zone, abnormal intraplacental vascularity. Um, I think we can call that as 
uh, uh, abnormal vascularization of the placental bed. We don't use the term tenting of the bladder wall anymore, bladder wall interruption and focal exophytic mass. So these terms, sh uh, these old terms should be discarded for future use and the new terms should be used for description. I'd like to talk about new techniques um, uh, and diffusion weighted MR is something that we've been using uh, for our cases as well. So this particular paper from 2009 has shown that it, at this at a B value of 1000 seconds per millimeters you can uh, clearly define the border between the placenta and the myometrium. Um, so this is an example. Um, this is uh, uh, these are T2 weighted images. There's some you know thinning uh, along the posterior wall of the uh, my posterior myometrial wall, posterior lateral, and along the right lateral aspect. But the diffusion ADC map shows you the placenta and the uh, uterine wall quite sig quite well. So here you can see the uterine wall appearing bright. Placenta is lower signal intensity, and then as you go further down, this is taken at a higher level. This is in the lower uterine segment, and you can see that you don't see the high High signal intensity of the uterine wall anymore so there's definitely thinning of the myometrium in this particular region so it increases we, we did a study in on diffusion weighted images and we found that it actually increases your confidence it doesn't increase the sensitivity or specificity of uh, uh, but compared to the t2 weighted sequences but it did increase our confidence level in assessing for placenta creta spectrum Quickly, I'd like to show you some cases. This is case one. Um, these are sagittal images, uh, T2 weighted images from left to right, and you can see the bulge, placental um, uh, focal bulge in that region. So, the description in this case would be um, so here's your myometrial thinning in this particular area, uh, loss of retroplacental dark zone, heterogeneous placenta, bladder wall interruption, and then focal exophytic mass. Um, this shows you the placental bulge and then the dark interplacental bands. This was a patient who had placenta in Creta. Another case, um, just looking at the images, so the red uh, arrow shows dark intraplacental bands. Greens, green arrows show you the myometrial thinning. You can see the myometrium really well up to here and then it's completely thinned out. Similarly on the other side as well there's myometrial thinning over here. Um, this shows you the focal placental bulge. The serosa is intact but there's a bulge in that particular region. Similarly on the right side as well there's a focal placental bulge. Um, this patient had uh, had a hysterectomy and you can see that this was a placenta in Creta with likely focal per Creta. So this is a resected specimen where you could see the placenta bulging out. On opening up this uh, 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 uterus, uh, uh, you can see the placenta with a lot of hemorrhage and sections show you the thinning of the myometrium. You can see the thinning out here and the focal extension into the placenta. This is case 3 where um, the red shows you the intraplacental dark bands, um, the blue shows you the overall heterogeneity in this placenta, um, the blue, uh, light blue areas show you the uh, placental bulge as you can see over here um, and then the green area shows you the placenta myometrial thinning as well. This is a resected specimen in this patient. You can see the big bulge along the, um, uh, so this is this is where the cervix would be. This is the uh, fallopian tube over here. And so this is the bulge from the placenta extending outwards. And you can see the, on a cross section really well, how the myometrium looks normal thickness over here. But then in the lateral aspect, you can see the extension of the placenta into the myometrium and focal bulging in this region. So this was a uh, placenta in Creta because there was no breach of the uh, serosa just about two millimeters from the serosa. So in summary, placental adhesion uh, spectrum or, placenta, uh, uh, or abnormalities, it's a challenging diagnosis, needs uh, clinical experience, expertise and of course collaboration with um, other physicians from the obstetrics department as well. Um, some of the cardinal MRI features include dark intraplacental T2 bands, placental heterogeneity, disorganized vascularity and uterine bulging. MR is not a reliable predictor of depth of invasion. Um, it's the, the, the volume of dark intraplacental bands or degree of abnormal vascularization may correlate with the depth of placental invasion. This is something that needs to be further evaluated with studies. 
ultrasound is the first imaging modality mr does add value because it establishes or increases the diagnostic confidence you can look for parametrial extension so it helps with anatomical information location of the surgical incision if you have any large vessels that are intervening as well um the accuracy depends on experience and expertise available and um some of these additional sequences like other green the balanced ffe and diffusion weighted images will be helpful um future prospective studies are needed to see if mr can be a uh, useful adjunct to ultrasound um and the management plan should be based on the worst read in these cases because that is what will decide how the patient needs to be operated needs to be managed these are some of the references thank you for your time